Hello and welcome to Naval Horizons. I'm Samina Mondal, a public affairs intern with the United States Naval Research Laboratory, part of the Naval Research Enterprise. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Commander Anton Orr, Military Deputy Department Head. Thank you for joining us, Commander Orr. Hi, thank you, thanks for having me. So how exactly did you get your start in the Navy? So when I was, I grew up in the Air Force. Uh, my parents, my mom was in the Air Force enlisted and um, uh, we grew up near air bases, and uh, when I was about 12 years old, I went to an air show, and um, at the time it was an F-18 Hornet, but uh, it was a flight demonstration for an F-18 Hornet, and um, at the time it did a slow speed flyby, so it does a high angle of attack, and it pitches up at about 35 degrees, and it uh, flies by really slowly, and at the time, you know, as a 12-year-old person, you're looking at this, and it looks like the thing is kind of floating in the sky like a helicopter. But the image from that air show at that young age kind of impressed me. And of course, I decided that's what I wanted to do with my life when I got older. And um, I'm not going to say that it was a straight line from there to here, but um, that kind of set me on the path to I wanted to fly planes. And um, that's kind of what got me to this point. Excellent. So, I mean, you're a man that has many titles within your career and that you've taken on within the Navy. So could you walk us through your professional background, a little bit about what you studied in school and how it got you to where you are today? Yeah, so um, like I said, when I was young, I kind of got inspired to fly. I didn't know if it was going to happen, but um, of course I set that as a goal early on. And, um, you know, I wanted to go get an education, get a college degree, of course, because that's kind of the, one of the prerequisites to get there. And um, I was in a military dependent at the time. And um, I looked at the academies as also because I really didn't know a way to finance in my education. So I was looking at the academies and the ROTC programs. And I applied to uh, the academies and got accepted to the Naval Academy, where I, you know, went to school for four years and got an ocean engineering degree. And, um, that was kind of the start for my education. So for ocean engineering, um, I didn't know much about it. I knew I wanted to be an engineer when I was younger um, and when I went to school, but uh, ocean engineering is kind of like civil aviation at sea. And so just kind of an interesting story about that was uh, when we were, at, when I was at the academy, um, our project, our senior project, capstone project, was to design a, um, a, a pier for the Queen Elizabeth II in the Baltimore Inner Harbor, and this was over 20 years ago, back before the Inner Harbor was really built up. But um, it was exciting because um, the city of Baltimore was talking to the Naval Academy and they gave it as kind of a project to, to do. And um, we designed the pier and we kind of costed some of the project out and uh, we pitched our, our pro or we pitched the ideas into the, uh, to the city folks. So we went up to Baltimore and gave those uh, presentations. And um, I mean, ultimately we recommended them not to do that specific pier. And, um, but it was very interesting as a, young person to be able to, I'm not sure if we influenced them, but it felt like we did a little bit, so. Very nice. So just along the way, you've kind of had that role of almost learning, but also mentoring along the way, which is... Um, I was probably more of a mentee, but yeah, but was <laughs> learning a lot. And kind of bouncing off of that, you talked a lot about ocean engineering, and that's, the, I guess, the sort of stem that impacts your day-to-day -day and your work. So could you tell us a little bit more about how that comes into play within your current position? Yeah, so again, um, I'm a pilot is my primary thing. That's what I did for most of my career. And I'm in, st and I'm in the STEM fields now, but um, one of the things about when you become a naval officer is you get a degree in whatever the, whatever, the, whatever the field is, whether it's a Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts, and then you typically go out and learn your profession. So my profession was flying F-18, so I spent most of my career learning, learning that skill. And it didn't matter what your, your bachelor's was, you basically got taught how to do that. But uh, for naval officers, you're going to learn whether it be submarines, whether it be aviation or a uh, surface, you're going to learn your profession independent of your degree. And so I did that for probably 15 or more years. And then um, after I stopped flying, I went to uh, get a, a master's degree at the Naval Postgraduate School in operations research. So I think, you know, having an engineering background was helpful um, when I was, you know, learning my profession, uh, because a lot of the stuff is engineering, a lot of the aviation stuff is engineering, not required, but it was helpful. And then when I went to, again, an operations research degree for my master's, of course, having that math and science background was helpful for that as well. So Excellent. I haven't got you to this point at ONR, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's impressive. <laughs> at, at, yeah, so at ONR, of course, I, after I got my 
degree in the operations research. Then I went to the Pentagon, which is kind of what we call a payback tour. You go back and you use the skills that you've learned from the Navy and you do operations research. So at the Pentagon, I was doing operations research, kind of doing model and simula models and si modeling and simulation optimization stuff. And we do studies to take a, a big Navy project and see how we can, you know, propose possibly make it better um, and use, you know, mathematics and science and stuff to do that, to do those things. But um, to your question, um, how do I use it now? After that tour, I came to Office of Naval Research and of course here we do um, science and technology and research and development and having an engineering background again throughout my life and career has been beneficial just to, you know, to be more in touch with uh, some of the science and mathematics and engineering really a very unique journey that you've had through every step in your career. So thinking about the greater scope of STEM and the functions that you serve for the Navy, what would you say its most important traits impact the way that you choose to create and design and decide on certain decisions? And how does it influence you? Um, yeah, so I, I would say um, it's important to have the technical background um, when you're working with technical people. Um, here at the Office of Naval Research, there's a lot of PhDs, a lot of uh, you know very smart people, a lot of people with uh, advanced degrees, and um, my role isn't necessarily to 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 have the, the deepest understanding because we have a lot of subject matter experts in all the different fields that uh, cover the spectrum. But um, it's to understand to it enough to be able to translate it to a military user. So, for example, when we interact with uh, folks at the Pentagon, the military uniformed people, um, some of the technical stuff, not that we can't understand it, but we don't necessarily need to understand it, or, and we, the military people that work here kind of work as translators to try to, not just, th there's not an understanding issue as much as how is that useful militarily, because a lot of the scientists that haven't been to sea or in the air or under the sea, um, they might have a great idea, but to try to find the practical use of that idea, um, that's kind of what our role as military people um, here at ONR is. Commander, as a department head and military deputy, it goes without saying you're constantly working on different projects. Could you maybe explain some of those to us today? Yeah, sure. So, um, so a lot of the projects that we have, um, we kind of have three big kind of chunks of things that we do at the Office of Naval Research. And this is a headquarters building, so we don't, I think you're working at the Naval Research Lab and there's probably 3,000 folks that work there and they're actually doing, you know, they're in labs and they're doing research. So here at the headquarters of a lot of these places, we kind of um, guide funding towards different projects. But the big chunks of projects that we have, we have basic and applied research. So, you know, for young or, or, or older postdocs or PhD folks, they do um, basic and applied research. That's probably about a third of our funding. We have uh, what's called uh, future naval capabilities, which are current things that the Navy has, and we find ways, science and technology ways to make, you know, incremental improvements on those things. And then we have uh, innovative naval prototypes, which are kind of, we use the term game-changing ideas. And so I'll just, I, I have a couple of things here I'll show you. Um, there's no basic research here, of course. Those are all documents and big, big papers, but uh, just uh, a future naval capability, which is kind of an incremental improvement. This is a rocket that's been around since the 40s or 50s. It's just a 2.75 inch rocket. Mm -hmm. um, they've been around forever. And so one of the projects that my department has done, and I'm the deputy department uh, person, not the department head, but um, one of the projects that my department has done is um, put some guidance into this rocket. So it's been around for 60, 70 years. We um, put some guidance, uh, it's a low cost, rocket and we made it a guided rocket and we um, transitioned it to some of our foreign partners. So this is kind of uh, one of the technology spaces we work in. We say, hey, this is a great thing, but we can make it better with some incremental improvements and um, it's already existing and it gets out to the field. So that's, that's kind of one. Um, some of the bigger projects that we've worked on in my department specifically, we have, uh, like you mentioned, aviation and weapons. So like lasers, directed energy things kind of those types of technologies. Um, and then aviation-wise, uh, one project that did not make it to the fleet was um, designing a, an aircraft that's unmanned. It was basically um, a vertical takeoff that can go on a ship, it can take off vertically and then transition to flight. So this is a model of what 
a project that we had. It didn't work out, but um, it's kind of uh, when you have the innovative naval prototypes, you take a lot of big risks. I mean, these are projects that cost you know tens or a hundred or more million dollars. But um, in order to you know have some successes, you have to have a lot of risks. So um, we take risks and we start designing and developing these projects. This is a project that we had with uh, with DARPA. They started it and then transitioned it to us. But um, the idea was this. It's a model, but um, a person would probably be about this tall. So it's a pretty big aircraft that was going to be designed, and it would take off vertically um, like a helicopter, and then it would transition to, uh, to forward flight, and then it would start flying um, like an aircraft. So um, big technology risk, a lot of risks in this project. Um, we spent a lot of a couple of years working on it, but it didn't work out. And, you know, with a lot of these big risk projects, some of the technologies that are developed throughout the process, they do transition. So... Um, just one more quick example, um, a railgun is a big project that we took on. Railgun is an electromagnetic railgun, so typically most cannons throughout the history of time have been fired by gunpowder. Um, if you watch shows in space, there's, you know, spaceships that fire bullets, but uh, they're basically there's electromagnetic rails that the bullet that travels on, and um, we were designing a railgun, and we actually did design a railgun, and, um, you know, launched the furthest projectile from a from a from a bullet or from a from a gun, um, and one of the technologies that transitioned from the rail gun is the hypervelocity projectile. So that's kind of fits in the big sebo, and then um, that gets sent out from the rail gun, and uh, we launched it about 100 miles, which is Guinness World Record. So that's a technology that did not again make it to the fleet, but um, a lot of the technologies that were um, worked along the ways did so yes and it seems that with the trial and error still a lot of pride that comes within putting yourself into the project and getting your hands dirty almost trying to make something work yeah I think you know the program officers and all the people I mean the program officers are here but there's a lot of you know in some of these projects hundreds of people if not tens of people behind them that are doing the work out there um, they're you know government and um, prime contractors that do this work so of course there's a lot of pride in their accomplishments so, Commander, looking forward to the future, what do you think are the specific areas of technology that should be used and would be used for naval challenges that are, may arise? Yeah, so, um, I mean, there's a lot of, of, of things out there. You know, in O&R, we have five departments. My department, like I mentioned, talks about aviation and weapons. Um, there's cyber, a department that addresses cyber and IT challenges that might be interesting to younger folks. Um, there's you know, undersea warfare uh, space that uh, also is interesting and um, some of the, you know, surface warfare technologies that are out there. But um, just from my department's experience, you know, we have a lot of autonomy interest, unmanned, you know, unmanned all vehicles, unmanned air vehicles, unmanned surface vehicles, unmanned underwater vehicles are all technology areas that are going to be in the future. Um, you know, our Admiral talks about uh, small, agile, and many a lot. And the idea behind that is that, um, you know, instead of having large aircraft or large surface ships that cost a billion or more dollars, um, that we have uh, less expensive uh, vehicles that are smaller and they're unmanned, so they're not going to be putting, you know, sailors or Marines at risk, but uh, smaller and agile. And then you have a, a number of them. So if you lose one or two, um, it's not as it's not as consequence wise a big as big of a cost. So um, and so one of the spaces that we're working in, uh, we've had this project that's been going for a number of years, but uh, they designed um, some small drones, unmanned aer aerial vehicles, and they also have a small unmanned uh, surface vehicle that basically, for example, they launched it out of uh, Norfolk and remotely drove it down to um, you know the Carolinas, and it was able to you know had UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, on its back that were launched, and it was able to go out and find targets. So a lot of the technology that we, we've been working on for a number of years, you know, it's out there um, in the field now, and um, they've been development at ONR and uh, the Naval Research Labs and all the different places uh, for a number of years and um, it's seeing a lot of use now. So. so Commander, if you could think back to your time at the Naval Academy while in college, if you had to give a fellow student of Naval Aviation and STEM a piece of advice that maybe you wish you would have heard, what would that be? Yeah, no, that's good. Um, you know, I'm approaching the end of my Navy career for one, so it's probably a good time for reflecting. Um, and I also have, you know, two young kids, adults, 19 and 21, just graduated college, the older one and the younger one starting college. So, you know, when I look back, I'm, I'm, 
I feel fortunate that I, you know, had kind of an inspirational moment as a young kid, right? I felt like I had something to strive for and um, and it was exciting, something that was exciting that I could, even if I didn't get there, I could pursue. And so looking back on it, and that kept me driven for a long time. Um, and I think, you know, find something that will drive you and um, and then pursue it with most of your energy. I think even after I got to flying, after I got to flight school, it was going to be challenging. After I got to F-18s, it was going to be challenging. And um, after I got there, it's it doesn't stop, right? It's like, okay, become the best um, that you can be in your field or profession, whatever that is. Just learn as much as you can. Uh, when I was a young ensign, a boss told me, you know, he's looking for somebody that's hungry. And so at a, at a young age, he's looking for people that are young and hungry to pursue whatever their profession is. So whatever you do choose, you know, become the best at it. Um, that's probably the advice that I would give. And, you know, one piece of advice I probably didn't take is, you know, find mentors, right? Find people that are in your profession above you and um, and seek out their guidance and help. They're probably eager to help. And, um, you know, that's one thing I probably didn't do as much as I probably could have. But, um, you know, that's maybe some of my reflections as I reach the end of this part of my professional life. Well, thank you for the wonderful conversation, Commander Orr, and thank you all at home for watching. Be sure to check out our past and future episodes of Naval Horizons, and until next time, I'm Samina Mondal.